Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to this new episode in the Elliot Hulse Show, where in this series we're going to be talking about the 40 things I was wrong about in my 40 years of living here on planet Earth. And so today is the second episode, and I'd like to explore the concept of eating your veggies, because all of us know from the time we were kids that if you want to be a big boy and grow, you got to eat those veggies, right? So kids all over the world are choking down Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, beans, and all kind of bullshit so that they can grow up and be strong like their daddy, right? So this has just been kind of common knowledge, I think, you know, uh, which doesn't necessarily make it right knowledge or true knowledge. Just because it's common don't mean that it's true, right? There's a lot of common shit out there, a lot of basic stuff going on out there that just ain't true. Um, I'm not going to make any assertions, but for today, we're going to explore whether or not it is actually necessary for a human being to live a long, healthy, vibrant, vital life without vegetables, without plant proteins or plant foods, right? So this is kind of like one of those sacred cow issues, if you will, right? You know how funny, right? That's my play on words, my pun. Sacred cow. You don't want to slay the cow of vegetables or vegetarianism or veganism because it's propped up to be something so enlightened, right? Uh, In a myriad of cultures, you know, you want to reach enlightenment, you got to just chew on grass, right? And, uh, and in our culture, in the West, it's seen as something that helps not only your body, your health, your vigor and vitality to eat a ton of fucking vegetables, but you're saving the planet from all of the toxic poop or whatever that's created by, uh, by the animals that we end up eating. So there's a ton of propaganda out there, and this goes completely against the grain. So let's talk about grains for a moment. I never questioned this. And I think most people up until maybe recently haven't questioned this. There's a lot of questioning going on now that the internet has, uh, has democratized information and given us access to many of the, many of the things we've been, that have been, we've been blinded to, all right? There was a time when only the TV or we'd all sit around the radio and listen to whatever Propaganda was spewed. So, uh, you know, now that the cat's out the bag, there's a whole lot of ideas that are floating around. Some good, not so good, but all worth considering, at least in my opinion. And uh, and so although I took it for granted, you're supposed to eat your veggies. Even when I became a trainer and understood the, the, the necessity of macronutrients and protein, carbohydrates and fats and all these things, uh, there was always a place for vegetables and it should always be there. Almost like medicine, right? Like, you, oh, you don't want to forget your veggies. Always eat lots of fresh fruits and veggies. So it's like, uh, it's, it's, it, I would say it's dogma, right? It's just one of these things that are unquestioned. And that's why I'm fucking questioning it here for y'all. Uh, again, I'm making no assertions, but I'm questioning. I want to question and so uh, I, would, I would assert that I was wrong about a lot of things when it comes to plant foods and, uh, and eating meat. You know, there are a lot of things that I was wrong about. And one of them that I was wrong about, but I discovered by experience I was wrong and I didn't need any proof. I didn't need any doctors to tell me. I didn't need any scientists to prove it to me. I didn't need the media to jump on board and assert and give me the thumbs up about what I'm supposed to think. I experienced viscerally in my body that uh, at a certain point in my in my early adulthood, I was starting to have some GI issues, farting, stinking ass farts, real bad farts, man, embarrassing. So bad that I had to quit a martial arts class I was in. It was horrible. I was in Capoeira, right? The dancing, fighting, the fighting dance. <laughs> Yeah, so I was doing a fight and dance, the Brazilian fight and dance, and I'm farting in my pants. And everybody, I, I guess I would win because everybody was running out the room, 
Man, I was so embarrassed. And back then, I was looking for uh, validation from women. You know, I didn't want to be embarrassed in front of girls now. But uh, the, <laughs> there were a bunch of girls in the class, and they were the first ones to turn up their nose and and uh, and frown at me for being so <laughs> nasty. Hit that nasty guy, and I. You know, I have no problem saying I'm a good-looking guy. I'm a good-looking guy doing the, the fighting dance, and I'm thinking, here I am, a stud, got muscles, and, uh, and girls are turning up their nose at me, turning away because I was farting. And I didn't, dis- I didn't know why I was farting so much. I, it was a scourge. Until I asked a, a, a friend uh, slash uh, mentor. His name was John DeFlorio, and uh, I ended up working for him, and as a as a as a fitness trainer in his private studio gym and he was a Czech practitioner. Paul Czech. Paul Czech student. He was like level three at the time. And so uh Paul, as you know, has been a tremendous mentor in my life. And uh if you want to meet some of the most brilliant health practitioners out there, they're Czech practitioners. And that was the first time I learned about this. And uh and I asked him, I said, John, I don't I don't know what's going on with me, man. I'm I'm eating healthy, right? I'm eating lean meats, veggies, and whole grains. <laughs> and so, John, tell me, what do you think is going on here? And he says, you might want to eliminate grains from your diet, specifically gluten-containing grains. And he offered me this acronym, BROWS, B-R-O-W-S, standing for barley, rye, oats, wheat, and spelt. So I didn't know what the fuck spelt was, so that wasn't a problem, but barley was in beer rye yeah i lived in new york long island right so jews and rye bread right you ever see that seinfeld episode with the rye bread so uh yeah so we got a lot of rye bread in new york and i freaking loved it loved it love going to the, to the deli and getting a and getting a uh, a sandwich on rye bread so barley rye oats i was eating a whole lot of oatmeal because it's supposed to be heart healthy they even have a little heart on the box you, I don't know how they get away with this propaganda, right? Doesn't the FDA need to shut them down on that? How the hell do you put a heart in the box and tell people it's heart healthy? And I'm over here farting like a maniac, like a monster. So uh, oats, wheat, and if you know anything about processed food and uh, in the sick, sad American diet, wheat is in everything. There's wheat everywhere. It's such a cheap grain to create, uh, that along with corn and soy, uh, interestingly, are government subsidized. It makes you wonder, wherever, wherever money's being funneled, you wonder what kind of information is going to come out of the propaganda that makes you want to have it, right? So you got to have all this corn and soy and, and, and grains. Uh, meanwhile, your tax dollars are, are, uh, are lining the pockets and keeping those, keeping those, those industries afloat. So uh, you got to keep buying that stuff. So of course they're going to tell you it's good for you. You need to eat a lot of it. Fiber, right? That's one of those sacred cows also too that we're going to be talking about today with my guest. I'm having a guest today. So uh, it won't be just me ranting. It'll be me and, uh, and a guest, an expert, mind you, an MD, who uh, he and I are going to talk about why vegetables are trash and you should be eating all meat. Nose to tail, he says. All meat diet. Is that possible? Is that healthy? Won't you get cancer? Well, we'll find out. So uh, I've got a few notes here, as I always do, and I tend to just ignore the notes and fly off the top of my head. I will say, I will add that, um, you know, of course, my point here is that the government tells us we need to eat more veggies, grains, plants, less meat, and fat for your health. Yet that's not working. We know it's not working. That's the other thing too, folks. Experiential knowledge. Uh, anecdote. Anecdote. People are like so anti-anecdote. But I tell you, there is no knowledge without self-experience, without experience. Otherwise, you're just a, a, a brainwashed book reader who spits shit that you read. And that's, what, that's what most of us are. Me, I follow the advice of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who says all of life is an experiment. 
The more experiments you make, the better. I'm all about experimenting. Tell me something. Tell me not to do something. I'm going to do it. Why? Because I want to find out for myself. My dad used to used to warn me about that. He says, son, you can take my advice and not touch that hot stove top or you can burn yourself. Either way, you're going to learn your lesson. And uh, that's one great thing about my father is that he let me burn myself a whole lot. So, um, and I've been burned. I've been burned. I've been burned by the, by the processed food manufacturers, the grain producers, the, the fake fat creators. Remember when they told us that margarine, margarine was better than butter because it was made from vegetable oil. You got to remember, there's, a, there's, a, there's an agenda out there to fruit, fruitize you, to turn you all into fruitcakes. Everybody wants to eat all these damn fruits and vegetables. They're even turning meat into fruit, right? They're taking... I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but they've got this new fake meat that is like, I call it NWO meat, New World Order meat, you know, because it's uh, it's just one more attempt to drain us of our vitality, turn us into bland, gray, robot consumers. Uh, the more the more you can divert away from nature's produce and create your own, the higher the profit margin. So what do you what do you think? What do you think about all this? So yeah, it's not working. We're sick, fat, sad, dumb, depressed, and uh, we're eating a whole lot of grains and vegetables. It ain't working, so it might be time to go back to the meat. So in 2002, uh, it was the first time that, uh, number one, I, came, I became uh, conscious of the fact that eating grains was destroying my gut. Uh, all the grains that I was eating was, uh, was creating inflammation in my colon. And we, you know, I'm not going to go into the reason why that happened. It has something to do with another, another industry, big pharma, and uh, many of the medications that I had end up, ended up taking, antibiotics, things of that nature that destroyed my gut. I didn't know anything about this. You know, this was back in like 2000, like I said, 2002. Um, and I was also introduced to the work of Weston A. Price by Paul Check uh, around that same time. And uh, although I was aware of his studies, by the way, those of you who are not familiar with Weston A. Price, I would invite you to check out one of my favorite resources, which is his book, A Scientific Study, a real scientific study, self-funded, right? So the thing with you guys in these fucking scientific studies, find out who's funding them. Look at the agenda behind it. This man was self-funded because he had a, uh, uh, an inkling, he had an idea, he was a doctor, and uh, prior to the advent of processed foods, he, uh, he recognized that human beings had a particular structure in the, in the skull. Wide sweeping palates, he would call it. Broader. We were broader up here, right? And then uh, I would say, you know, like, like post, I think the World War, maybe World War II when we started, uh, you know, packaging and processing foods, uh, he began to notice that the palates were shrinking. The skulls were shrinking of his patients. Oh, what the hell's going on? Now, how do you know that the skulls were, were, were shrinking? How, does, how did he know that? Well, he was, he was also a dentist. He worked on people's teeth and he started to recognize the strange anomalies, strange things are happening where children are now coming in with these crowded teeth, right? We take it for granted. How many of you take it for granted? Oh, you know, I got braces because my, uh, my, my daddy needed braces. My mama needed braces. It's genetic. No, in fact, it's not. And he discovered that because he set out to study the various uh, untouched, if you will, tribes. He called it untouched or un, uh, they weren't introduced to white man's foods or commerce food. And, uh, and, um, and while he went out and he studied like the Maasai in Africa and the um, Eskimos and uh, some people that lived up in the Swiss Alps and, and shit like that, Native Americans, Aborigines, he discovered uh, a myriad of different things, interesting things. Number one was that they were free from the, from the shrinkage of the skulls, like we take for granted in our culture now. Uh, there were, there were no, there were no dental maladies was a term he used. No dental maladies. And, uh, and they didn't, they didn't have the crowding of the teeth. So all the, you know, all the, 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 the backwards teeth, 
teeth coming in sideways, teeth on top of teeth that we take for granted these days. It didn't exist. It didn't exist in these cultures until, and this is what he found that, you know, on the outsir- on the outskirts of many of these uh, untouched tribes were people of the same race, but uh, like, for example, the trucks were, were able to get in. They were able to, to ship, to bring in commerce foods. And so on the outskirts of these protected people, there were those who were of the same race that all of a sudden, not only are their teeth crowding, but they were far more susceptible to disease. I think tuberculosis was the big thing at the time. And, uh, and, they, and they suffered. These people suffered. Their health suffered. Uh, there was cancer where there was none inside the tribe. There was cancer outside the tribe. Uh, so, you know, read the book. Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Look at the pictures. Even if you don't read the book, right? Say, you, say you're not the reading type. Look at the pictures in this book. And the before and after pictures. Before white man's foods, after white man's foods. So not only was it the introduction of so-called white man's foods or commerce foods that caused these deformations, but it was uh, what he noted and discovered was that these people who had ex- extraordinary health, prized not just prized but even in many cases worshipped animal food butter seafood seafood uh was highly prized especially for many of these tribes or or these people who lived you know very far away from the sea they would go at lengths in order to retrieve seafood for particularly for uh pregnant and nursing women and growing children because they you know they're j- j- just from years of experience, right? They didn't have scientists to prove this to them. They didn't need an MD to give them thumbs up to believe something that was true. Uh, through years and years of, 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 of noticing, being aware, paying attention, they discovered that children of parents, of mothers who ate these foods, animal foods, rich in vitamin A and D, and certain other minerals and things that uh, that Dr. Price didn't understand at the time that he called the X factor, which I think we refer to as vitamin K or something like that today. I'm not super sure uh, that they that the, that the children were smarter. They were healthier. They were more vibrant, more vital. Uh, they were just better. Right. And you are, you know that you are what you eat. Our body is, is made up of the building blocks and we're pretty damn frail these days. Right. We're deformed. We're retarded. And we're frail. No two ways about it, you know. Uh, I can't cite the studies, but I've read many, uh, I've read a lot of stuff. Doesn't mean that I believe it, but I like it because it works with my echo chamber right now. Um, that we uh, that we are dumber. We've been systematically dumbed down chemically and socially. And um, and I don't think it would take much to figure to to like look a little deeper, and you'll see that that's the case. So uh, six sad, stupid people as a result of eating a whole lot of veggies, right? Sounds crazy. Well, we'll find out. So I was introduced to uh, Weston Price. Uh, I learned about being gluten intolerant. Uh, I eliminated grains from my diet, ate mostly meat, and a lot of my problems cleared up. I was having uh, gut problems, skin problems, and even to this day, I have scalp problems. And this is what led me to the work of our guest today. Um, if, if you look at my head here, it looks almost like people say that I'm having uh, male pattern baldness. Uh, it's not actually, it, I may be going bald, but it's not male pattern because none of my, none of the males in my family, none of the paternities have a pattern of male baldness in my family. None. Not even, you know, not even like my grandfather's. Uh, this is a result of a really bad case of psoriasis, psoriasis, scalp psoriasis. And so it's actually, get, it's actually getting better. And it has a lot to do with um, not just eliminating grains, because I was aware of eliminating grains, but eliminating various vegetables from my diet. We'll talk more about that. So uh, before I introduce my guest, I'm going to I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him uh, before we get him on. Um, and so the intention for this show is to discuss whether or not humans really need veggies to survive or are we actually designed to be carnivores and our guest. Uh, asserts that we are actually carnivores and uh, he's got all kinds of evidence um, 
that that supports this. And so without further ado, his name is Paul Saladino, MD. And a uh, brief introduction to Paul Saladino, who I've been, my, he's been blowing my mind with all of his content these past few months since I looked into the uh, carnivore diet because I've been looking at specifically heal my scalp psoriasis and it seems to be working it seems to be working out i'm not 100 percent carnivore i do have some hang-ups about it although it sounds like a great idea it sounds like a wonderful idea um but i do have some hang-ups about it maybe i'm not doing it right and so uh i'm going to ask him some 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 questions about that when we get him on here so paul saladito md earned his medical degrees an md y'all from the university of arizona in 2015 he also completed his training uh, in the Institute of Functional Medicine in 2018, which is uh, pretty pretty dope. I've been a fan of functional medicine for a long time. And what makes functional medicine a little different than medical medicine is that functional medicine seeks to find the root cause of our issues, where medic medical medicine is, is really about giving medicine, right? It's about uh, you have this issue, you need to take this pill. And, uh, and it's interesting because... Medicine really doesn't have anything to do with health, right? They're not interested in, 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 in uh, understanding and restoring health. They're interested in, uh, and not all doctors. I'm not, I'm not knocking all doctors. It's just the training. Uh, they're, they're interested in looking at symptoms and relieving symptoms. You know, and, and most people, that's good enough for them. Most people, sick, sad, dumb, and depleted of nutrients, are not even interested in their health. They're too busy watching The Simpsons and uh, and eating eating bear claws and uh, watching watching football and drinking beer and wings and shit like that. So they're not interested in health. They just don't want to have indigestion while they're eating their wings and drinking their beer. The Packers are playing tonight. Wings. Get me my Pralisec. So um, you know it's it's kind of a customer demand thing. And uh, but as we're evolving, as we're growing up, as we're waking the fuck up, we're realizing that, damn, we got to take a look at our health and not just try to. To uh, to, to subside these symptoms. So uh, I found Paul's content on YouTube where he's looking for ideas about the carnivore diet. I was impressed by his nose to tail concept. I really like this. We're going to talk more about this when he gets on here. And the idea that if we eat the whole animal like our ancestors Meat can provide everything we need for good health. That means you can spit out that spinach and give Popeye a ribeye. So I got a bunch of great questions for Paul, for Dr. Saladino. And in a moment, we're going to introduce him to the show. I hope you guys enjoy. I'll see you there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Paul Saladino to the Elliot Hull Show. Dr. Paul, thanks for joining us, bro. Man, it's so good to be here. Thanks for having me on, brother. <laughs> man, you're as excited as I am. I know, dude. I get so stoked about these. I love doing podcasts, man. I can tell. And you've been killing it lately, bro. So I'm going to jump in and I got a question for you. Uh, so you believe that humans are carnivores. We're supposed to be carnivores and that vegetables are trash. Tell That's us exactly. how you that conclusion. <laughs> That's <laughs> totally the truth. I couldn't have said it better myself. Man, it's been this long journey. It's been this really interesting journey. I'm a physician, and throughout my medical training and residency, I've had this burning question, this burning ember in my gut. What causes disease? I've always been interested in understanding what causes human health and what causes human disease, and I've never been satisfied with the mainstream medical model, which is treat the symptoms with a medication. That's always never, it's never, never been satisfying to me. It's always bothered me. And so throughout my training, I've always wanted to know what causes disease. And you know, the, the best answer that I can come up with is that food is a huge part. It's probably not the only thing. I think that community and spirituality and, you know, like meaningful lives and these are important too. But I think that the biggest contributor to our health or disease is food. We put milligram quantities of, of medications in our bodies and they affect our you know, they affect our physiology radically, but we put kilogram quantities of food in our bodies. This is such a complex molecular signal and it's touching the immune system and it's touching our gut lining. And it's really, I think, the crux of whether we tip toward autoimmunity and inflammation or we tip toward good health and 
peace and calm and balance in our bodies. And so then the $64,000 question is what is the ancestral human diet? What diet are we programmed to eat as humans? And I think that many people would argue that there are, that can be individualized. And I think I'm open to that possibility, but I have this suspicion, my hypothesis, my postulate is that at the core, there probably is one human diet that is basic for everyone. And we can build on top of that. People might have more tolerance on top of that. But when I think about what I've come to discover over the last year, looking at anthropology and human evolution, the fossil record, yeah. studies of nitrogen and in, in collagen from uh, samples of Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens from 80,000 years ago, and connecting that with what I see now in terms of autoimmunity and the way that our immune systems work, I'm very, con I'm, very, I'm very convinced, I'm very curious, I'm very intrigued by the possibility that humans are actually what I would call, and what others have called, facultative carnivores rather than omnivores. So it's this process of kind of looking at, looking at the way that the immune system seems to be responding to plants. And if we think about it, if we just back up for one second, I love letting people do this sort of thought exercise. Imagine you're a plant, Right. You're like an ancestral mustard plant, right? And you're, you're out in the middle of a field, and this is during the time of the dinosaurs, and you're just chilling, you're soaking up the sun, making mustard seeds, you're a brassicate, you're an ancestral brassicate. And you hear this boom, boom, boom. What comes around the corner? A big brontosaurus, and that brontosaurus is hungry, and that brontosaurus sees you and is gonna eat you, and you think, I mean, this is anthropomorphic, but the plant says, uh-oh, I'm gonna get eaten. <laughs> like, I am dinner for this brontosaurus, and so, this is kind of the, the idea that plants are stationary. Plants don't want to get eaten. The goal of that ancestral mustard plant is to pass on its DNA to the next generation, just like the brontosaurus or the human or the Neanderthal wants to pass on its generational DNA. And what's happened is that over the last hundreds of millions of years, plants and animals have co-evolved. But plants have evolved defense mechanisms. They have evolved toxins and pesticides because that's the only way that they have survived. That's the only way that it has discouraged a brontosaurus from eating it ad libitum or until it's, you know, eating every single plant. What plants have done is co-evolved toxins that limit the amount of that plant that can get eaten by the animal. And it's been this constant warring effect of animals evolve to kind of tolerate the plant and the plants evolve new toxins. And the plants that evolve more toxins, those plants reproduce and thrive and the animals that evolve more mechanisms to be able to tolerate those plants, those animals thrive if they're herbivores. But we as humans had this incredible shift in what we were consuming when we became Homo erectus from Australopithecus. And those probably don't have a direct lineage, but if you look back at human evolution, there's a real transition 1.8 million years ago where we probably came out of the trees, there's this ancestral Australopithecus, and now there's Homo erectus, and Homo erectus is more erect, and Homo erectus became a hunter. And so we stopped evolving with plants. You know, our primate ancestors were kind of co-evolving with plants. But once we became Homo erectus, we, I would argue, we advanced as a human species because we were starting to hunt. And we broke off from co-evolving with plants. And we kind of lost our ability to detoxify most of that stuff. And animals became our ancestral food. There's lots of evidence for this in the fossil record that we were hunting megafauna and then, like I said, if you look at the ancestral record from 70,000, 80,000 years ago, the amount of nitrogen in collagen was so high, it was higher than other carnivores at the time, like hyena. So we can look at the nitrogen. We know that nitrogen accumulates when you're eating more animal foods. And we can look and say, ah, our ancestors were most likely eating a lot of animals. We were primarily hunters. And so we have this evolutionary lineage of being hunters. We stopped evolving with plants. We started evolving with animals. And then if you look at the way that animals, uh, that humans and plants interact now, there's this real discordance, you know? We're not well adapted to all these toxins which are still in the plants. And the plants are sort of saying, hey, don't eat me. You know, I have all these toxins. But the animal foods animals can run away. They don't need a toxin defense mechanism. So animals, I think, really provide the best source of nutrients for humans at a basic level and are probably this ancestral diet that we can eat to be optimal without any of the toxins in plants. Wow. <laughs> so if I understand you correctly, plants have poisons in them. And when we eat these poisons, uh, as a result of them not wanting to be eaten, we suffer. 
as well because we have a hard time breaking a lot of these so-called poisons. I, you know, I'm being inflammatory here, of course, but you you call them pesticides. Now, I was only aware of pesticides that like were industrial pesticides. Um, what are some of these pesticides that are naturally occurring in plants, and what plants are the are the greatest offenders? <laughs> There's so many. So if you look at plant toxins, so overall there would be this uh, this idea of plant toxins. Within plant toxins, you could break it down into plant pesticides, which I'll talk about. Another whole category of plant toxins would be things like lectins, which are carbohydrate carbohydrate binding proteins. Stephen Gundry's talked about these, which can trigger immunologic reactions in humans. A whole another category of plant toxins would be things like oxalates. But if we just go to the first category and we think about plant pesticides, you're totally right. Most people think about pesticides as like glyphosate or Roundup, the things we spray on plants. But there's a fascinating paper from Bruce Ames from 1990, I believe, and the title is Dietary Pesticides, 99.99% .99 All Natural. And the title means that in a given day, most people ingest about 99.99% .99 of the pesticides they ingest are from the plants they're eating. They're made by the plants to discourage animals and insects from eating them. He goes into great detail in that paper about all the different plant pesticides. The, the example that most people will know and will probably come as a shock to most people is the compound sulforaphane. Sulforaphane belongs to a family of compounds called glucosinolates. Glucosinolates are in the brassica family. So we go back to this ancestral mustard plant, right? Mustard is the precursor for all the brassica vegetables, kale, collard greens, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, right? Those are all brassica vegetables. Those all had the ancestral mustard plant as their grandfather. That entire family of plants has glucosinolates, right? They make this compound, they make this family of compound called glucosinolates, which are isothiocyanates. Now, how does this work? These are plant pesticides. These are produced by the plant to discourage animals from eating them. Most people have heard of sulforaphane when Rhonda Patrick is talking about like broccoli sprouts and they hear about sulforaphane as being beneficial. But here's the real sulforaphane story. Sulforaphane doesn't exist as sulforaphane in any plant. It's too oxidatively reactive. What I mean by that is that some compounds we ingest from plants are very good at giving and taking electrons from other molecules and creating free radicals. And this is one of the ways that sulforaphane is very reactive and harmful for humans. If the sulforaphane molecule existed in a plant, it would kill the plant because it is so oxidatively reactive. It's such a strong oxidant. So what the plant does is it stores sulforaphane as a precursor molecule, which is called glucoraphanin. And we see this pattern often in plants. They have a precursor pesticide and they have an enzyme and they're separated by a compartment in the plant membrane. When an animal chews the plant, they combine and they make the toxic chemical. This is exactly what happens with sulforaphane. So glucoraphanin is the precursor, myrosinase is the enzyme. When you chew kale, broccoli, any of these foods in the raw state, you are combining myrosinase and glucoraphanin and you are forming sulforaphane. And so the, that is the only time that sulforaphane is formed. What happens when we eat sulforaphane? Sulforaphane comes into the human body and our body says, whoa, that's a very oxidatively stressful molecule. That's going to make free radicals. I'm going to detoxify it. But in the process of detoxifying it, it activates the NRF2 pathway and sulforaphane can kick up glutathione a little bit, which is why people think it's beneficial because it does have some hormetic effect. Hormesis is this concept that a little bit of a toxin can be beneficial. The problem with sulforaphane and the reason the plant made sulforaphane, at least in humans and other mammals, is that this family of compounds competes with iodine at the level of the thyroid to inhibit iodine absorption into the thyroid. So this family of compounds, the glucosinolates, isothiocyanates, these are the major, uh, the major reason for endemic goiter in the world. These are goitrogens. There are other compounds that are goitrogenic as well, drugs we use in psychiatry, lithium, amiodarone, but sulforaphane, glucosinolates, isothiocyanates are goitrogenic compounds. They cause goiter. Have you seen these pictures of people with these huge swollen necks? That's goiter. That's what happens when people don't get enough iodine. And so the plants have figured out, hey, 
I'm going to make this compound called sulforaphane. I mean, obviously we named it, but I'm going to make this compound if you eat me and it's going to mess up your thyroid if you eat too much of me. So this is a plant pesticide. This is not something that benefits the plant. It's not something that benefits humans. I would argue it's a net negative for humans. The reason it gets confusing is because the supplement companies want to promote sulforaphane as a hormetic, meaning it's going to increase your glutathione. And glutathione is a molecule that we use as an antioxidant, right? But the tricky part is this. We don't need sulforaphane to make enough glutathione. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of studies that show that living a radical life, heat stress, cold stress, exercise, sun, these can all also be hormetics. They can increase your glutathione and give you adequate antioxidant status. We don't need sulforaphane, but we're sort of being sold this like bill of goods by the, by the supplement company saying, hey, this will improve your glutathione, but they're not going to tell you about the fact that it's actually a toxin that's going to potentially affect your thyroid in a very negative way. So all these people just crushing broccoli sprouts. There are tons of cases now of actual thyroid disease from people. Examples on my Instagram, Sam Dancer is a good example, a really well-known uh, CrossFit athlete, you know, was just crushing the broccoli sprouts and green smoothies and getting tons of this and really messed up his thyroid. So it's just, it's totally a, a different paradigm shift, right? So the sulforaphane, perfect example of a plant pesticide. Plants don't want you to eat them. That's crazy. That doesn't make any sense because isn't, isn't a vegan diet the healthiest diet on the planet? You see all these people promoting <laughs> veganism and you're sitting here telling me that when they chew on their grass that it releases toxins and, uh, and, destroy, and destroys their body. This can't be true. Well, you know, I, I did veganism about 13 or 14 years ago and generally what you see with vegans is that if you look at the arc of veganism, People generally improve for a couple of months because they've cut out processed foods. But if you look at the long-term arc of veganism, it's a pretty steady decline over the two or three years. And there's this whole rash now of all these people leaving veganism. I mean, you know, I, I don't even, I've stopped paying attention, but there were a number of people putting videos, well-known vegan influencers saying, hey, I felt horrible. I got autoimmunity. I got nutrient deficiency. So yeah, I think that there's this real misunderstanding in the populace that the vegan diet is super healthy. And that has to do with the fact that meat and animal products have been incorrectly maligned. There's been bad interpretations of science. We're using science that is mostly epidemiology to say that meat is bad or that vegetables are good. If you look at arguments for veganism, the only evidence you can provide that vegetables, fruit and vegetables are healthy is all epidemiology. There's no direct evidence of this. Just like there's really no direct evidence that meat is harmful for humans. This is the problem. This is my greatest sort of disappointment in, in medical history and the way we've thought about evolution for the last 60 to 70 years is that we've been so misled by epidemiology. Epidemiology are studies that are just done with surveys. They're not taking a study group and adding vegetables or taking a study group and taking away meat or taking a study group and adding meat. They're just doing surveys of people and looking at how healthy they are at one point in time and asking them, what did you eat for the last 30 years? Well, at first brush, that looks like it could be useful. But when you think about it, there are so many confounders because of this concept of healthy user bias. The fact that in basically throughout the westernized world, whether it's Western Europe or the Western United States, um, We've been told since the 1950s that animal products are bad for us. And so people that eat vegetable foods do other healthy behaviors. And that's what's causing it to look like the vegetables are valuable in the epidemiology studies. Mm. And so there are some fascinating studies <laughs> where if you compare, so if you look at, there's a great study in, in, in Britain that I can tell you about. But basically what they did is if you look at vegetarians in Britain and you compare the death rate. So if you compare the mortality of vegetarians in Britain to the regular populace, vegetarians look like they live longer. But if you compare the, the mortality rate of vegetarians to other people who are health conscious, they live the same. So it's all this healthy user bias, meaning that people who are not vegetarian, but are doing the same healthy behaviors of vegetarianism, get all the benefits, all the purported benefits, they live the same amount. So really, there's strong evidence that the epidemiology is confounded 
you know, and all the studies that say vegetables are so good for you, they're just epidemiology. They're not interventional. It's just confounded by this healthy user bias, this idea that people who eat vegetables for the last 50 years have been the people who do other healthy things, exercise, sleep, sun, etc. It's changing now. There's plenty of people who eat meat who do all those behaviors, but it's a, it's a healthy user bias. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, so the veggie eaters are usually good boys and girls and do what they're told anyway. So they're not smoking and they're riding their bikes and eating their veggies. And because of those other things, they tend to live longer, not because they're eating more vegetables than meat. Is that correct? That's correct. And if you take away, if you look at the other people who are also riding their bikes and doing the other healthy behaviors, they live just as long as the vegetarians, you know, <laughs> like it's not the vegetables that are making you live longer. The vegetables so Dr. Are- Saladino, th- then tell me, what about the planet? Isn't the planet going to be destroyed by all this animal poop if we all <laughs> just ate animals? Don't we, need, uh, don't we need to save the planet by becoming vegan? Well, we definitely need to save the planet, but I think that the nuance around environmental arguments is much more, is much more interesting. And it, I think if you actually look at it, everybody going vegan will not save the planet and will probably cause a major environmental catastrophe. There's some incredible work being done now to look at the actual carbon carrying capacity of the soil. And the idea that animal poop is probably one of the most important things that can happen on soil to increase the carbon carrying capacity. Many people have noticed this. There, there were millions, millions and millions of bison in the United States around the world before they were hunted to extinction. And we did not have the amount of greenhouse gases that we had before. Clearly, it's not animals that are increasing greenhouse gases. If you actually look at the studies, the majority of greenhouse gas emissions are due to transfer, transportation, technology, and industry. The vast majority, 70% for those three or more. Agriculture alone, by most estimates, is about 13% of greenhouse gas emissions. That's animal and plant. But then when you divide agriculture in half, animals are only half of that. They're only about 6% of the greenhouse gas emissions and plants are the other 6%. What people don't realize is that plant agriculture generates a lot of greenhouse gases as well because you've got you to use your tractor, which is going to have greenhouse gas emissions to harvest the plants. You've got to use machines to process the plants. You've got to use trucks to move the plants around. Mm-hmm. And that's a really big deal, right? That's, that is producing the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions as animals. But if you look at animals, they can have a regenerative effect. Animals certainly produce greenhouse gases because we do need some equipment and CO2 to like care for the animals and greenhouse. And animals do produce methane, but methane is cycled differently in the atmosphere. It's a little bit of nuance about environmental science. But the magical piece that I just mentioned is that when animals poop on the ground, it increases the soil quality, it increases the plant life on the ground, and you can increase the carbon carrying capacity of the soil. So there are many now, and the idea is really gaining in strength that putting more ruminant animals, cows, sheep, lambs on the planet will increase the carbon carrying capacity. That may in fact be the only way that we are going to reverse climate change. That in conjunction with Elon Musk and Tesla and electric vehicles, perhaps, or net negatives, you know, in terms of other greenhouse gas emissions. If you're looking at the agriculture sphere, animal and plant, we really need to think about the way that animals can increase the carbon carrying capacity. And it's, it's, it's really a misunderstanding to believe that animals are going to do that. That's really a, um, a very sad misinterpretation of the science. There should be no one talking about cow farts. <laughs> no one. All right. Well, I'm, I'm almost convinced, but if I stop eating vegetables and fruit and grains and nuts and all these plant things, how am I going to get my vitamins and my, and my, my, my phytonutrients and my fiber? Uh, animals can't give me that, can they? <laughs> they can absolutely give you all of that. And I think this is one of the most interesting and incredible pieces of the equation. That if you look at what we know of nutritional science, animals are clearly the best source of vitamins and minerals for humans. They are the most bioavailable sources. And if you're eating an animal nose to tail, you can get everything you need to function optimally as a human. That includes vitamin C. And there's all sorts of interesting ideas about vitamin C. I did a video on my YouTube channel with Bart K about vitamin C. 
there is enough vitamin C in animals for humans to function optimally. I really believe that our conceptualization of vitamin C is wrong and that we don't need 1,000 milligrams a day. As I talk about in that video, I think 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day is probably hurting humans. Mm. There's evidence of that in conditions like G6PD or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. But um, if you look at animals, you can get everything you need to function optimally as a human in the most bioavailable forms. The one thing you mentioned there that people may question is fiber. Fiber is such an interesting story. If you actually look at the medical literature, there's no evidence that fiber is beneficial. There are a variety of studies that show that there's no benefit to fiber for diverticulosis, which is the formation of diverticuli in the gut, the outpouching of the mucosa and submucosal layers of the gut and muscularis mucosa. That's sort of a misinterpretation of an observation by Burkitt in the 1960s in Africa. But when you actually do the studies and you look at colonoscopy, people that ate more fiber had more diverticulosis. <laughs> so it's crazy. And then, you, then the people say, well, don't I need fiber to poop? I thought that was what you were going to say. Don't I need fiber to poop? And I said, don't worry. I had a beautiful poop this morning. <laughs> I'll prove it to you. But you don't need fiber to poop. And that is probably the biggest shock to people in this. One of the biggest shocks in, in, this, in this idea is that fiber is not what makes us poop. A healthy gut microbiome is what makes us poop. And what we're finding is that there are many ways to achieve a healthy gut microbiome, but eliminating fiber is often very helpful for people with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There are some very compelling studies showing that in people with idiopathic constipation, that is constipation for which physicians cannot find a cause, the removal of fiber in a study of 63 people, uh, which were divided into three groups, so one third of the group was divided into zero fiber, one group was moderate fiber, one group was high fiber. Zero fiber group fared the best and they, they had complete resolution of their constipation, gas, and bloating with removal of fiber. So this is a crazy thing. There are other studies that, that strengthen that. Constipation is not improved by fiber, and people are just losing their minds right now, but I swear to you, your doctors are wrong. Read the literature. Try it for yourself. If you're constipated, stop the fiber. It, it caused 100% removal, 100% uh, you know, improvement in constipation, gas, and bloating in people in that study. And I've seen this over and over. So people don't need fiber to poop. And the other thing people think about fiber is, doesn't fiber prevent colon cancer? Absolutely not. If you look at the studies, there's a series from 99 and 2000 in the New England Journal of Medicine. They tried up and down, right and left. They added fruits and vegetables. They added cereal fiber supplement. No change in the rate of colonic adenoma recurrence. Uh, so precancerous and cancerous lesions in both men and women. So they, there's never been a study that showed that fiber changed or prevented colon cancer. It's crazy. So if you think about it, this is the, probably the most, one of the most radical pieces of it. There's really nothing in plants that you cannot get in animals in a more bioavailable form without any of the toxins. Okay. All right. So I think I'm going to try this out. I'm going to go and get a bunch of, I'm going to go get a big bag of frozen chicken breasts. <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to eat just chicken breasts tomorrow. Is that, the, is that the best way to go about eating a carnivore diet? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that when we are thinking about eating a carnivore diet, if people believe what I've said or if they're intrigued by it, you know, and we imagine our ancestors, let's go back to Neanderthal and Homo sapiens 80,000 years ago. You know, my tribe, I'm in your tribe because I want to be in your tribe, right? And we're going to go hunt an animal. We say we get a woolly mammoth or a big animal. We, we killed it. We're going to eat that whole thing. We're going to eat nose to tail. And when we look at this, it's so fascinating. There are unique nutrients in every part of that animal. If we just eat the muscle meat, we're going to miss out on a lot of unique nutrients that are probably crucial for human optimization and survival. Muscle meat is incredibly beneficial. And there certainly are examples of people eating a carnivore diet who are just eating muscle meat. But I think that for most people and long term, eating the whole animal is the most evolutionarily consistent way to do this. And it's going to ensure that we get all the minerals and vitamins we need. In muscle meat, there's about half of the B vitamins, but the other half are in the liver. So a great start is adding liver to muscle meat. And then if you really want to get good, you'll think about connective tissue for a source of glycine. You need some fat, some omega-3, an iodine source. This is like bone marrow or brain, some seafood. And then I think carnivores and most of our ancestors probably ate a calcium source, whether it was fish bones or ground up animal bones. We need some calcium, but people need to think about eating the animal 
nose to tail because humans do need calcium and humans do need copper from the liver and humans do need things that don't appear in muscle meat. And so eating nose to tail is really the magic. That's when you get all the nutrients. And from what I've seen, and people are seeing more and more, that's when people feel the best eating this way is when they eat nose to tail. And I would argue strongly that is the most evolutionarily consistent way to do that. So chicken breast, probably not the great idea. People can eat chicken if they want, but I've generally found that ruminants, you know, are the, are the most <laughs> kind <hate> of chicken. <laughs> It's kind of the best thing. Like you want to, you want to get ruminants. You want to get cow or right. lamb. It's so much more nutritious. Oh yeah, liver. It's so much more satisfying. I mean, I haven't eaten chicken. I think in like eight months that I've been a carnivore. I just don't even crave it. I just want to eat a steak all the time yeah. and liver. So I'll tell you what I had for breakfast, and it'll illustrate the concept. So I got up this morning and I drank some water just to like get everything going. I had my beautiful carnivore poop. I stretched a little bit. I sat with my juve light, and then for breakfast I had. So I'll have two steaks. So I had two grass-fed steaks, and then I have the steaks with just salt. I don't use any spices because I don't want any plants in my diet right now. But in addition to those steaks, I had three duck egg yolks. I don't eat the white because a white of, a, of an egg has avidin, which can bind biotin, and I like to eat the yolks raw. And the duck egg yolks are delicious raw. So I had three duck egg yolks. Now, the egg yolks have more B vitamins. They have more choline. They have incredible sort of complement of minerals in them. And then I had liver. So I had about three ounces of raw liver. Um, and then I had salmon roe, which is, you know, the eggs of salmon, which are a great source of omega-3, especially phospholipid-derived DHA. And then I also had some tallow, a little extra fat on the steak. So, and then a little bit later today, I'm going to eat some bone meal or some eggshells for calcium, and I'll probably eat some bone marrow. So I'm just, I'm trying to eat the whole animal, just like we would if we killed a woolly mammoth or something. And if we look at indigenous tribes and even carnivorous animals, they often go for the organs first. And I think that's the way we should think about it, is prioritizing things like organ meats in our diets. Most people prioritize steak and organ meats are a second, but I would rather eat, I, I mean, I'm going to eat more steak than I am organ meats, but I've got to get the organ meats every day. I would argue things like egg yolks, liver, salmon roe. Those are, those are the magic, you know? You can always get muscle meat. That's easy. But you got to get those magical pieces, those organ meats. Well, I got to come clean, and I, and I have to acknowledge that I've been a fan of what you've been doing for uh, a couple weeks, I'd say. Maybe a month and a half now. And I just came off with some long fasting. I was doing some prolonged fasting, and I was trying to heal myself of some autoimmune stuff. I had some psoriasis on my scalp, and I've got some rashes on my elbow. And while I was fasting, uh, I had no symptoms. And then for the longest time, I had been eating sort of a ketogenic diet. And although the symptoms were lessened, I just noticed that when I start eating again, I, I continue to have the problems. And I, I couldn't pinpoint it until I started finding your videos. And I, I, so I started taking out some of more of the animal, I mean, the uh, plant foods that I was eating, specifically nuts that were not soaked. And, uh, and things started clearing up. And I did that for a good three weeks before my birthday, which was April 10th. And Happy I was, birthday. Uh, thanks, man. Just turned 40. <laughs> yeah. And I was, I, I bought all, I, I even got the, because uh, I'm totally sold on what you were saying. I was a fan of Weston A. Price many years ago. And I realized yes. that like, yeah, we need the, the collagen. And it, we, so I got a bunch of also uh, liver worst. I love liver worst. And so I bought all that stuff. I had been doing it, feeling great. But then around my birthday time, uh, I started eating birthday cake <laughs> and, then my, and then my mom invited me over and she makes rice and beans. And so uh, I carved up and it was interesting, although I was feeling great up until that point, uh, after, after carving up and then feeling guilty and then going to the gym on Monday, you know, the next the, a few days later and training, I felt amazing. I felt like Superman. And I realized it had a lot to do with the fact that I just ate a ton of starch. Yeah. What do you say to athletes that, you know, like for, for me, for example, like I, I'm trying to clear up some health issues, but I still want to be strong in the gym. How do I go about doing this carnivore thing, but still get that Superman feeling from eating carbs, foods like, uh, you know, grains? <laughs> grains. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? I'm kind of in a bind here. Well, so here's the question for you. How long were you doing carnivore? Uh, well, strictly carnivore, I'd say about three weeks. 
Okay. And then how long were you doing keto before that? I mean, were you fully fat years. adapted? Years. Yeah. And of yeah, course yeah. I would break it here and there, but like 90% of the time I was eating keto. Yeah. So I think that there's an interesting kind of uh, thing here. I think a lot of people, and I hear this from all the time from people because I used to do jujitsu and I want to get back into it. But a lot of people email me and say, Hey, I know you do jujitsu, but I notice that when I do carnivore, I feel kind of flat. I don't have the, the explosiveness. What I have noticed personally is that it took me about eight weeks to get fully adapted. And that was just, you know, micronutrients and then the sort of the full sort of metabolic change over to ketosis for me. And that after that time, I didn't really feel like I was that flat in the gym. And when I eat carbohydrates, I don't really feel a whole lot better in the gym now. I'm not doing quite the same stuff as you. I'm not doing strict strength. I'm doing like Muay Thai and kind of a mix of like strength and endurance type stuff. But I think that the first thing I would say to people is if you really want to try this, give it a full six to eight weeks to see how your body adjusts and how the metabolism goes. The other issue that people run into when they're doing carnivore and they feel flat in the gym is they're not eating enough fat. And that can be a main issue for people mm -hmm. is that they need more fat because really you can either use fat or carbohydrate for fuel. You can't really use protein. So if you're too high protein, a lot of people are going to end up feeling flat in the gym. And so for high performance athletes, BJJ, CrossFit, for you, for lifting, this kind of stuff, you can try a carnivore diet that's higher in fat. You want to make sure you're like at least 70% of your calories are from fat. Let your body adapt to that. And I bet you'll get pretty darn close to where you are with carbs as your fuel source long term. But see how you do. If that doesn't work for you and for the highest level athletes who really want performance and can't get it with fat, I think they should try it first on full carnivore because I think that most will get there. You can always incorporate like one or two carbohydrates and see how you feel with those. Um, and you can try and use carbs that you may tolerate. And everybody's going to be a little different in what carb they tolerate. Some people might be able to do white rice. White rice does have lectins. It might trigger people. There are sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes have oxalates. So you're kind of balancing, right? One of the carbs people do sometimes is honey. So technically, honey's kind of carnivore, you know? Honey's not really from a plant, you know? I mean, a bee makes it. So yeah. if you really wanted to, you could use honey. Now, we know that honey and carbohydrates are are going to cause dental problems and issues with sugar. But right. you might try honey if, the, if you really are triggered with rice and sweet potato and you really, really want that carbohydrate performance thing. But I'm, I'm really not convinced because I really haven't seen it in myself. Again, we're not doing quite the same activities. But, you know, when I was hanging out with Ben Greenfield, the morning of the podcast, he's, he's an animal. He's like, let's do Tabatas. And I was like, oh, my God, I never do this shit. <laughs> you know? So we got it. You know, we got up and we did like, what did we do? We did four minute intervals for like over 30 minutes. And I was like, I mean, wow. he's an animal. And I was like, I, I was fine. I mean, I was hurting because I never do Tabatas, but I could do it. You know, I was able to do it. I didn't feel wiped. I didn't feel flat. I was like, I can do this, you know? Um, and that was, you know, 30 minutes of Tabatas, like four minutes, four minutes. We never had a break. It was just, you know, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off for 30 minutes. We were alternating the aero bike, which is a machine of torture and like a series of, um, of a cross of just like, you know, body weight exercises, burpees and kettlebell swings and stuff. And so personally, I've not felt any decline in my performance, but I'm now eight months into it. And I really try and push a lot of fat. I'm often I'm surfing as much as I can. I'll go out for like three or four hours and just paddle, 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 paddle. I'm fine. Um, so I think that the performance is possible, but there may be like a little bit of uh, adjustment in terms of like how much fat, what's the fat macro. And then if not, you could try honey, but I bet I bet for most people, they don't actually need carbohydrates for performance, but we're still learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, I'll take your word for it. And it's better not to have the rashes than to have a big pump. So I'm all right <laughs> with that, man. Well, so this is the thing. And I talked to Mark Bell about this a lot. You know, glycogen in your muscles will store water. So, you know, people are going to feel more inflated and actually bigger, <laughs> right. and more tense with carbohydrates. Whether or not that reflects a difference in strength is questionable. Mm. You, you will have bigger pumped up muscles. So for somebody that's doing like a physique competition and it's just visual and not performance, they may need something to like fill the muscles, you know? Mm. I don't think I look deflated, but you know, I'm not like, I mean, I'm pretty vascular in general as a guy, but like, you know, I think that if people are going to notice when they eat carbohydrates, they're, they're going to get more glycogen. They're going to feel more pumped. Whether or not that's going to be a difference in strength is questionable. And then you have to think about all the long-term things like 
what's your mood, what's your, you know, libido, what are the, it's all give and take, right? It's this constant sort of equation that we're all working on. Well, Dr. Paul Saladino, MD, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us here and share with us about why we should be eating meat and why vegetables are trash. And meat and organs, meat and liver. <laughs> meat and liver. Yeah, liver. I love liver words, man. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, absolutely, everyone listening to this, go to Dr. Paul's uh, YouTube channel. That's where I found him. He's uploading very regularly. He's got a lot of great interviews on there. Devour this stuff. Check it out uh, and give it a try. I'd love to know if you guys give it a try. And also on Instagram. I follow Dr. Paul on Instagram, and he's got some of the coolest memes out there. He's always posting uh, cool memes and, uh, and scientific studies because he's a doctor and he's a scientist and he's not just pulling the shit out of his ass. He knows what he's talking about. He makes himself a living lab and he goes in and, and fetches that, that research for you guys. So go check him out there. Anything else, Dr. Paul, before we uh, part ways, buddy? That's it. On Instagram, I'm Paul Saladino, MD. On Twitter, I'm MD Saladino. I've got my YouTube channel. I'm a, I'm a physician. I work with clients privately. If people want to do functional medicine consultations with me, they can email me at paulsaladinomd at gmail.com. And I got a podcast. I'm starting, brother. I got a podcast. Nice. So on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, you'll see a bunch of videos under Fundamental Health with Paul Saladino, MD. That's going live on iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify this week for people that want to listen in their cars. So all those interviews and a button more will be going live. So check out Fundamental Health later this week. Check out my YouTube channel and then be prepared because in six months, I'm going to write, a, I'm writing a book right now. I was just talking to my publisher this morning. Got to do it. It's coming. It's coming. But yeah, it's great to meet you, man. It's great to talk. Uh, we'll do it more. We'll go into more depth. All right. Wonderful. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day, brother.